Praise the Lord, everybody. Glory to God. You know, um, I've been preaching the Gospel since... Uh, well, I started witnessing, I should say I started witnessing, uh, uh, leading people to Christ. Uh, the, de- the next day after I got saved, October 16, 1977, 745, I made Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. The very next day, I was an alcoholic and drug addict for 10 years. Uh, that, that night, the Lord appeared to me in an open vision, pointed to me and said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you to the ends of the world. Uh, the next day, I woke up and I was totally uh, free uh, from any drug and alcohol addiction, pills. I mean, I took every, all kinds of things. Twice, I almost over OD. Uh, and it was the grace of God at that time. I didn't even know that uh, anything about the Lord. But after I got delivered and saved, He told me, He said, I want you to start telling people what I did for you. And I said, well, Lord, I'm not a preacher. You know, I don't, I don't have any tie. I don't have a white shirt. Because that was my understanding about it. You go to church. And the only time I ever wore a white tie or, or a white shirt or a tie is when a funeral was. But the Lord spoke to me and He said, No, Roger, that's, that's my dog right there. Marley, I'm trying, to, <laughs> I'm trying to do my Facebook, son. Can you hold it down? Anyways, uh, Marley, please. <laughs> yeah, that, that's my dog, Marley. Say hello to the people, okay? Now, can... can okay, all right, all right. So, <laughs> anyways, um, the Lord told me to start witnessing and telling... Marley... Get over there. Get down. The, the Lord kept on telling me, tell me, go out and tell people about me. Tell them, tell them what you, what I did for you. So I would stand outside the, the bars and and tell people about Jesus and tell. They'd ask me because they all knew me. My little town where I was from, Parkersburg, West Virginia. Uh, running, run, been in them bars and clubs since I was 14 years old. Uh, so they knew all about me. You know, I mean, I just <coughs> on the street. All the time, one of my one of my best friends I went to high school was the biggest one of the biggest drug dealers in the, that city. They had a big drug bust uh, uh, before I got saved, and he ended up in uh, Moundsville Prison, spent uh, 18 months and up there for drug possession. And later on, uh, after he came out of there, I saw me preaching on the street, and, and uh, I let him. I, some young girl in the, our city park there led him to the Lord and told her told him he needed the Holy Ghost. And anyways, uh, I laid hands on him. He came up to me and he knew who I was. Laid hands on him and uh, he got filled with the Holy Ghost and he began to come out there on the street preaching with me. But uh, so uh, then then uh, then later on when the Lord uh, began to speak to me and uh, I got an opportunity to go. Uh, a good pastor loved me and, and had me come to his church. I was on the street for several years, and uh, all the churches were were coming against me and saying I was of the devil and all kinds of stuff. And you know, I like what Jesus said: "How can the devil cast out devils?" And most and, and all of the the men uh, that I that we were leading to the Lord were in the same kind of lifestyle we were: drugs and alcohol. And, we were called the Wild Bunch, and we were wild. We would get up, we would go to this uh, little uh, cemetery, Mount Olivet Cemetery, not too far from my home, and we would literally go up there on a Friday night, pray in tongues for about I don't know a couple hours, and just get so full of the Holy Ghost, and we just get down on the street, just letting the Lord use us. And uh, oh, we stirred up devils. The Parkersburg police were having a lot of challenges with us. We were warned a lot of times by the Parkersburg police. Uh, you know, I remember one time my friend Steve Arthur, we were at a, the, called the Wheel Club, a little country honky-tonk bar. I'll never forget this. This owner there, Steve, was preaching right out there in front of that bar. And I mean, these old, these old wild, <laughs> you ever preach in front of a honky-tonk bar, I'm telling you, it can get crazy. So the owner got tired of it because it was stirring up. We were just causing all the devil. The Lord was using to stir up all kind of devils. And in those days, you know, he didn't have banners or bullhorns. Or we were just wearing our regular shirts. Nobody made any Christian shirts. You know, this was way back in 1977, uh, 78. 
you can not understand what we were doing. So anyways, this owner of the, the wheel club came out there and, and had a big ball peen hammer and was going to hit Steve. And, and I mean, this guy was big. And I saw this as God is my witness. Steve stood in front of that man. And I know that, that and it was an angel of the Lord that, that when that man raised up that hammer, he was going to hit Steve in the head with that thing. And he, he had that thing raised up like that. And he could not put it down. He said, I don't know what it is, but there's something that's holding me, that's keeping me from, I want to come out here, I want to kill you. I, I'm so angry at you. And see, it was the devil sent that man out to, to, to kill him. Now, that man never got saved, but let me tell you something. Out of fear of God, he walked back into that, into that club that he owned. So, later on, when the Lord called me into a full-time ministry, uh, on a Greyhound bus with one one place to preach, uh, I met this I met this pastor, this bishop. Uh, his name was Arthur Reese from uh, uh, San Jose, California, Full Gospel Church in Christ. And I was in Parkersburg, and the pastor of the church that I was working with, Pastor Walter Minnie, he came up to me. I was staying in a, a little tra- tra- little trailer way out in the country. He came up to me and he said, "Brother Roger, get your clothes." I said, "What?" He said, "Just." Just get the clothes and come to the church. So I go to the church, and uh, there, 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 here's Arthur Reese. He's he he is the bishop of all, of all these churches called Full Gospel Church in Christ. And uh, Pastor Minnie's talking about talking to, to him about my ministry, and so uh, Bishop Reese says, "Well, well, you know, we're going to be going down doing a ministers' conference in Rockwood, Tennessee." And I thought it was interesting you know, that Rockwood, Tennessee, in the area where, if you ever watched the movie, in that area is uh, Buford Pusser, and that's that, that's where he was from. And if you ever seen the the movie about how he was uh, a sheriff, uh, honor, uh, honor a man of honor, uh, trying to stop all the drugs and gambling in that area. But anyways, that the, the one of the pastors of the church down there, he, he uh, built him a new church, and the bishop as he goes so. I end up being the afternoon speaker that day, and it's funny because the bishop, uh, the pastor of that church, when he looked at the, you know, the, he didn't know who I was, and when the Lord had me in there, the Holy Ghost just moved, you know. And so the the, the bishop, uh, Reeves, and he, the vice president of the of the organization, uh, Margaret Van Camp, he said, "Let's have Brother Roger preach on the last Friday night service." So when I did. The Holy Ghost began to move. People got got, got begun to get miraculously healed, and God was moving. The Lord opening doors for me. So they said to me, they said, uh, Brother Roger, we were having a, a camp meeting there. This was in April of 1982, and he said, Brother Roger, we're having a camp meeting in August of 1982 in Aberdeen, Washington. We'd like for you to come and, and, and minister. So when I got back there, uh, actually. Uh, Margaret Van Camp gave me money up to go take a bus, and uh, I took back a Greyhound bus to go back to Parkersburg, West Virginia. I told uh, Walter Minnie, Pastor Minnie, and Pastor Minnie said, "You know what, Brother Roger, we're going to go to that." I said, "Well, wow, really?" So he, the church bought a new van, and so we all drove over, all the way over there. And as we were driving over there, you know, I mean, you know, drive thousands of miles from Parkersburg, West Virginia, Aberdeen, Washington, it's all the way across the country. So when we got there, it was in a camp meeting, it was in a wooded area, and uh, I remember clear as a bell that I was the afternoon speaker, I was a Tuesday afternoon speaker, and uh, that day, uh, after the morning service, a lot of the uh, ministers and people said, Brother Roger, we're going to go to the mall, and the Lord said to me, no Roger, I want you to go to the woods. So I went to the woods and I just started praying in the Holy Ghost. Just, uh, this start, my, my, the service was going to start at 1.30, so from 12 to 1.30 I just kept praying in the Spirit. And, and I kept praying in the Holy Ghost and I just kept praying in tongues and praying in tongues and praying in tongues. And, and my message was I was going to preach on eternal life. That was my message. But when I got up there, when they introduced me, something supernaturally happened to me that I never witnessed. Before, I've witnessed before, and and never to this day have I've ever had this manifestation of the Holy Ghost. But 
when I when they introduced me, they had this wooden platform up there in this wooded area, uh, and uh, when I stepped on that wooden platform, my feet caught on fire, and I thought, dear God, my feet is about to burn, and all of a sudden, the Lord just began to take over my voice. Uh, and I began to preach and I began to prophesy that judgment was coming to the house of God. That God was going to start killing preachers. That the Holy Ghost was going to bring divine judgment to preachers who have been living in long-term sin and refuse to repent. <laughs> you know, that isn't the kind of message you want to preach to people in California pastors in California, the first time you ever met them, that God would give you a message like that. Well, I got two responses. Number one, I got a lot of response of, of the pastors being very angry at me. And number two, I got another response where every, people witnessed that I, I was a man from another world, where it talked about uh, Paul talked about angels and flames of fire. And, and so anyways... Uh, some of the pastors said, oh, now, Brother Roger, you know, if you're ever over this way again, give us a call and, and come preach in our church. And I thought, well, I'm already here. So anyways, to make a long story short, I, when I eventually got to San, San Jose, California, and, and, and met Bishop Reeves, and actually he had me stay in a little travel trailer, a little camping trailer on his property there, a church property, and I began to travel with him in different churches. Uh as he would go down to Southern California, and then the Lord opened up doors for me to preach in some of these churches. And the Lord began to speak to me, some of these churches. He told me exactly when these men and, and, and women were going to die. And I said, Lord, I don't understand why you're showing me this. He said, because I want to let you know, Roger, that I've made you a needle in the body of Christ. I said, Lord, People don't like needles. I don't like needles. I know. I tell you, when I was a little boy, and uh, and, and and my mother would, uh, my mother would have to bribe me to go to, go to a doctor because the first thing she would do is take me to a toy store. And if she would take me to a toy store, I'd go in there, and then she'd tell me take me to the doctor, and he would tell me to look up there. And I knew if I looked up there in those lights, he's going to stick that needle in me. And I never did like needles. And the Lord said, "You know, you're a needle." I said, people don't like needles. He said, I know, but I use you as a needle because needles bring healing when that, when, when that skin is, 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 is purged, when that puncture comes. And he said to me, he said, I said, Lord, I don't really want to be a needle. He said, I know you don't, Roger, but I need needles in the body of Christ. So as I began to minister... Uh, I remember uh, in 1990, uh, I was at uh, Kenneth Copeland's Minister's Conference. That was his first Minister's Conference he ever did at that time. You know, he did it privately. He didn't, want, he didn't do it publicly. And, and at that time at Eagle Mountain Church, uh, there was probably about 100 or 200 of us pastors, ministers that were there. A very small gathering. Uh, then later on, I would go there for several years, and then uh, they got the reputation about me and, and found out, you know, I, I also pastored my own church in Christ Christian Center, and uh, a lot of times I'd take my whole church down there to the West Coast Believers Convention. But then they found out about me that I was a hell brimstone preacher. And uh, so some of the Word of Faith preachers, uh, pastors, uh, begin to criticize me, begin to condemn me, and... You know, and then, uh, but the Lord said, uh, you know, don't pay any attention to it because, uh, you know, ignorant, you know, when you're ignorant, you can't help ignorant people. There are some people that you, you can never teach. And all you do is love them. That's all you can do. You don't get in strife with them. The Bible says, uh, a man of God, the book of Timothy says, don't get in strife. Uh, because unlearned and ignorant questions avoid knowing that that they breed or birth strife and a servant of the Lord must be patient and have to teach helping those that recover themselves out of the snare of the devil so you know uh, I, I noticed something about the Lord kept talking to me about and when I go to a word of faith church and I, and, and also I, I actually uh, 
at one time, uh, Kenneth Hagin, uh, who is known for teaching Mark 11, 23, 24, uh, that's how he started his ministry, being raised from a deathbed, 16 years old, of a, a, a deformed heart. I, uh, I was a partner for Kenneth, Kenneth Hagin Ministry for a long time. He eventually uh, had a, a service for those that were pastors, but not Rhema graduates. But he he ordained me and laid hands on me, his healing anointing on me when I was uh, at his uh, one of, one of the ministers' conferences there in Rama. And was, I think it was, I think at that time is he was around seventy nine or eighty years old. And then another pastor friend of mine, uh, uh, Philip Godot, uh, which had a church in Cal- Sacramento, California, Calvary Christian Center, who was a spiritual son of uh, Fred Fred K. Price in Los Angeles. But anyways, uh, so I was I was around a lot of Word of Faith ministries. Uh, but the Lord began, and, I, and you know, I would I would watch the Holy Ghost move, and I would see people uh, filled with the Holy Ghost, and and, and uh, dancing in the Spirit, and laughing in the Spirit, and those are all manifestations of the Holy Ghost. But then the Lord began to remind me something. He said, that ain't all the function of the Holy Ghost. And so I began to read the book of Acts. Because I was dealing with things in my ministry that I, that, that it wasn't about preaching on the street where people were falling under the power, uh, speak, uh, dancing and shouting and all that. He said, one of the functions of the Holy Ghost, Roger, is divine judgment. And see, most people, Preachers will teach you, especially those that are baptized in the Holy Ghost, charismatic, word of faith. They'll always teach on 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and talks about the nine gifts of the Spirit. And Paul wrote about it. But here's something you need to understand. That in the book of Acts, there were divine manifestations of judgment of the Holy Ghost. We read, I, I want to go to the first one, and it's in the book of Acts. And... It's in here. It has to do with uh, well, it's the fifth chapter. Excuse me. It has to do with Ananias and Sapphira, verse one. But there's a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira. His wife sold a possession and kept back part of price of his wife. Also, being private, it and brought a certain part and laid it to the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has now listen? Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? And while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? What hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast lied not unto men, but unto God. Now notice that. As soon as he said this, and Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came upon them that heard these things. That's Ananias. Then his wife later, after he's buried, three hours later, verse 7, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came, and Peter then said, and told her the same thing. Verse 9, he said under, How is it that you agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which is buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry you out. Now notice, Peter wasn't in there and laying hands on Ananias and fire. They weren't dancing and shouting and praising God. There was a divine judgment because they lied against the Holy Ghost. See, the Holy Ghost don't have to forgive you. What did Jesus say? He said, all manner of sin is forgiven except the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost isn't the merciful one. The Holy Ghost isn't the high priest. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus is the merciful high priest. He is our advocate. The Bible says there's an advocate or a mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He's the one who shed His blood. The Holy Ghost didn't shed His blood. So the Holy Ghost don't have to forgive you. Now you won't hear this priest in a Joe Osteen church. 
You won't hear it preached in the Kenneth Copeland Convention. You won't hear any. You won't hear it preached uh, at, at uh, the uh, T.D. Jakes. You won't hear any of them preach this. And I'll tell you something that that the Lord spoke to me and said. Uh, I am going to have judgment in the house of God. Peter preached it. I, I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. Uh, <clears throat> don't take my word for it. Book of Peter. Check this out. First Peter. Now you go, you go to understand something that none of the these epistles wrote had to do with the unsaved. He wrote it to the church. He Paul's letter, every Paul, letter that Paul wrote was to the church. They called the Pauline epistles. Now watch this. In First Peter, I'm in Second Peter. I need to get over to First Peter for a minute. Hold on. First Peter. First, chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, where's judgment going to begin? At the LGBT parade? No, they've already been judged. Jesus said, Jesus said, those that believe shall be saved, those that believe not shall be damned. They've already been judged. They're damned. They don't believe Jesus is Lord. They don't, they don't, they don't quit living their homosexual life, the behavior. They're going to end up in hell. He said, judgment begins at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God. Paul wrote, Peter wrote this. And if righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So here we read back in the book of Acts, the fifth chapter, divine judgment of the Holy Ghost. Now, that wasn't the only place. Let's go to Acts, the twelfth chapter. Here's another one. Check it out. Acts chapter 12. And uh, let's, let's read verse 18. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what, what was become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. Now what is Herod doing? He's commanding Peter and all of them be put to death. And he went down from Judea and Caesarea and their abode. And Herod was highly displeased with him, with them. Of Tyre and Sidon. Now he's a king. He's a king. It reminds me of President Biden. I don't like calling him President. Joe Biden. He is highly displeased with the church. Especially, he calls us uh, Christian terrorists. Yeah, we are Christian terrorists. We are terrorizing the devil. Paul said, I preach the terror of the Lord to persuade men. Yeah, you call me a Christian terrorist. No, I don't have an AR-15. No, uh, I'm not going to go into uh, to an LGBT parade and use a gun, but I am going to use a weapon, and that is the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, the Bible said. Piercing the hearts. Now what's this? This is in the New Testament. I'm going to tell you something about the New Testament. Look at that. We talk about the message of grace. Well, let's find out about grace. Now this is the New Testament. This is after Jesus was raised from the dead. If you read John 1.14, I want to read this to you. You mean to tell me that grace will have divine judgment? Oh, yes it will. I showed you in the book of Acts. But I'm going to show you something else too. John chapter 1. 
Now, you ain't going to hear this in a Kenneth Copeland convention, Word of Faith, uh, T.D. Jakes, but, it's, but you checking out for yourself. Amen. Everything I'm going to show you and prove you is in the Word of God. That's why it's there, and it's the New Testament. Y'all want to talk about the New Testament? Well, let's find out what the New Testament says. Verse 7, verse 16, And His fullness have all we received, grace for grace, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now when He was raised from the dead, and He went back to the Father and presented that blood upon that mercy seat, that, that, that redemption, that covenant, that new covenant. See, the new covenant first started between God and Jesus. It took a, re, it took a man who got us in sin, Adam. And the Bible said in the book of Romans chapter 3, all men die. And it says, in Christ, all men shall live. Not just physically, but spiritual, eternal life. So anyways, here we are in the book of Acts. And Herod, the 12th chapter, verse 20, Herod was highly displeased with them, of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain, their friend desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, now look at Herod, he's a king, he's got arrayed in royal apparel. He's sitting on his throne, Look at the haughtiness, the pride. This is a perfect example of Proverbs 29.1. What does Proverbs 29.1? Righteousness exalteth a nation. But there wasn't righteous here. This is a perfect example of Psalm 9.17. All nations that forsake God and all the wicked shall be turned into hell. He's a king. He wants to kill Peter and all of his, those that are working with him. He's angry. That's why people like Biden will, is using the... Biden don't care about the LGBT. Get real. He, he's a voting whore. He'll do anything to get people's votes. He claims to be a Catholic. Well, what Catholic is going to support homosexuality? But he's a voting whore. That's why he got Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris, when she was a prosecutor in Oakland, California, DA, she would put people in jail for small drug crimes, but she was she was having no long-term sentence over pedophiles and rapists. And when they had the BLM riots, Kamala Harris was paying money to get them out a bond, paying their bond. Now watch this. Verse 21, And upon a set day Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, Watch this. The people were shouting, It is the voice of God and not a man. And immediately, what happened? Immediately, the angel, wait a minute, what? What? The angel of the devil? No, 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 no. The angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up his spirit. Divine judgment over a king. You think God's playing around? No, he's not playing around. Jesus is getting ready to return. And we are going to see acts of divine judgment. We're going to see acts of divine judgment in the church. We're going to see acts of divine judgment in Hollywood. There are going to be com comedians standing up, bragging about, boasting about uh, the LGBT. And they are going to literally fall dead in front of the people. There are 
They're going to be pastors. I don't want to use the word pastors. Reprobates that are having seducing spirits are going to come into their church. And God is going to even do divine judgment. And as soon as they say anything against God and against the word about the el about and support homosexuality, they're going to end up dead. You're going to find major politicians who have been roaring up their voice, thinking they can stand and brag, get on their big corporations. They're going to end up falling dead because God will not be mocked. And I love you. I have to preach the truth. Paul said to Timothy, preach the gospel in season, out of season, reprove and rebuke. There are times the Lord says you rebuke. Paul is an apostle, and one of the functions of an apostle is to rebuke. To get the church following what Paul wrote in those epistles. He said, you follow me as I follow Christ. Paul warned us in 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 the book of Timothy, in the last days, there will be seducing spirits. You check the Google. You've got people like T.D. Jakes having men in their church uh, honoring a homosexual man, uh, talking about words like evolve, talking about, well, the LGBT church. He calls it a church. They need to go with their people. He don't speak against it. You've got uh, you've got Derek Hayden calls himself a gospel superstar singer. Before he got before he got married, he got into adultery. Got he had had a pregnant with a, a woman. He was on a show that was so perverted, and I prayed God when that show came on, they'd take it off the air. Called the street. Preachers of L.A. Dear Lord, so much perversion in that. I don't even want to go into that. A judgment is coming. I remember I was preaching at uh, Mardi Gras. Uh, and this black man came up to me. Now I'm not referring to the race, but I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out a demon here. This black man came up to me and he was so angry and said, uh, I don't like what you're doing. I don't like how you're beating these people down. I don't like how you're offending these people. And you make a big mistake when you get into a Holy Ghost preacher because the Holy Ghost is going to expose you. And the Lord said, tell him who he is. And I did. I said, let me tell you what God told me you are. You're a homosexual sodomite pastor. You have a church here in New Orleans. You're down here today looking for tonight looking for strange flesh. And I kept banging on him with the Holy Ghost. And I said, admit it. Why don't you admit it? Why don't you admit it? Because God has busted your front. And he yelled at me and he said, yeah, 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 that's true. That's true. I am a pastor. I am a... And he took his, this young boy he was with and kissed him on the lips. And then the word of the Lord came to me and said, thus saith the Lord, if you don't repent, by the next year, you will not see the sun shine on this earth. Now I'm going to tell you something. God ain't playing around. Did that man repent? No. No, he didn't repent. He just laughed. I'm telling you something. God means what He says. He'll bring divine judgment. I had a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, I'll never forget this, Jerry Cottrell. Uh, I love Jerry. Uh, uh, he, he was a tip preacher. Oh man, I mean he could preach. And, and I mean people would run to the altars when he preached on hell. I mean... I. Had this tent, you know, in West Virginia, out in the woods, you know. And I mean to tell you, I mean the power of God would shake that tent. People would get out of that tent. I don't care how drunk they are. I, don't care how, I mean the Holy Ghost would just hit them with the sea bomb. I'm going to start saying that now. The sea bomb. That's called the conviction bomb. 
And people would run up there. Well, one night he was preaching and some demon-possessed man came through there with a motorcycle. I mean, he just went right through that tent, ripped that tent, up, well, right, <coughs> drove right through that tent <coughs> with his motorcycle. And Jerry Cottrell prophesied to him right there after he did it, Thus saith the Lord, because you have touched the, the holy of God. You have touched the man of God. You shall not see another night this day. And guess what? After that meeting, Jerry got done. There was that same man who was killed head on by a truck that night. Let me tell you something. God ain't playing around. So immediately the, the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. He was eating the worms and gave up the ghosts. Have you ever heard that preached at, Jer at, at Joel Osteen's church? Have you ever heard it preached at a Kenneth Copeland convention? Have you ever have it heard it preached? Oh, you heard about the blessing. The blessing. The blessing. Is this a blessing? No. Was this the angel of the Lord? Yes. Was it divine judgment? Yes. Did the king, with his haughtiness and pride, see, God says in his word, I will destroy the house of the proud. There you go. Here is a perfect example of a king of authority who was mocking God and he was immediately struck dead. Now, the Bible said, confirm the word by how many witnesses? One, two, three. Here's our first witness, the book of Acts, chapter 5. Ananias of fire. Here's our second witness. Right here. King Herod. You want a third? Here it comes. The third witness is in the book of Acts, the next chapter, chapter 13. I want to go back here. This is important. After this divine judgment came, I thought this was interesting. A, a king who was who who put out a death. Who, I call it. I, I'll just go. A, a king operating like the mafia put out a death sentence on Peter. Was 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 struck dead and eaten up the worms. And it's interesting to know that after he did that. Verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. That's why I love persecution. Because Jesus said when the word is sown, immediately the devil will come to steal it and he'll bring persecution, persecution to arise for the word's sake. Now here we go to the book of Acts. Now watch what, Peter, what Paul's facing. I, I want to I start at verse 1 here. I think it's very important I'll bring this up. Now, verse 1. Now, there in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which has brought up with Herod, a tetrarch and Saul. Now, watch it. These men of God, prophets and teachers, they ministered to the Lord. Now, who are they ministering to? To the Lord and fasted, and then the Holy Ghost spoke. Now notice the Holy Ghost spoke here. The Holy Ghost spoke here. And what did it say? When they had fast prayed, they sent them away, and they being sent forth by what? The Holy Ghost. Not their own idea. You know, a lot of people, every time they see me preach, at an LGBT parade or uh, outside of a strip club or a nightclub, whatever, they always say, come to my country, come to my city. Look, I ain't going to any city that the Holy Ghost don't lead me. Paul was even forbid by the Holy Ghost to go into Asia Minor, and he was the apostle who planted churches. And I'll tell you something. I'm not going to go somewhere where grace doesn't lead me. I learned that a long time ago. I'm not going somewhere where grace don't lead me. 
Because if grace won't lead me, then there's no divine protection for me. There's no divine favor for me. And I'm out on my own, and I don't want to be out on my own. Amen. And the Lord will send me to places that you couldn't get a preacher to go to. You couldn't get a pastor to go to. And that's why He would send me. Because nobody would go out there and be a voice for Him. And I'm not out there to prove something. I'm not to go out like there with my, with my shirt up. I'm a big and bad preacher. No, 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 no. I'll be honest with you. There are times that the Lord and the Holy Ghost will use me that shocks me. Because I'm just a voice for Him. I don't want anybody, and I mean this with sincerity and love, don't follow my example. Learn by my example, but don't follow my example. Because what I do out on the street is not Roger Anderson, it is the Holy Ghost. And how do I know that? Because I have seen people saved, people healed, people delivered. I have gotten in people's face, ladies and gentlemen, God, big big tall people who could not be in a city block and the Lord would give me the boldness to speak and I would watch their heart melt like snow in a sunlight and fall on their knees and repent. And they didn't fall on their knees because of me. I'm not a big, big statue of a man. But I have the, the big one in me. And that's Jesus. And I learned something. Greater is He that's in me and He that's in the world. I'm not out to prove something. No. <laughs> now notice this. They're fasting, they're seeking the Lord. Now watch this. Verse 5. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the Word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Now where they're in the church. The synagogues. And also, John to their minister. And when they had gone through the isles on the Pappas, they found a certain sorcerer. What's this? A what? A certain sorcerer. Witchcraft. A false prophet. A Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. I don't mind if I'll tell you something. I put on there, politician. That's what, that's what politicians are who, are. who are supporting the LGBT. Who are supporting abortion. They're actually in sorcery. They're in witchcraft. What is the Bible definition of witchcraft? Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Anything in rebellion, witchcraft is an operating spirit behind it. Oh yeah. When you see someone in bragging about, well, you know, uh, uh, I love God, but I'm a, I'm a homosexual Christian. I, I, and Jesus still loves me. No, you're you're a witch. You're a warlock. You're in rebellion. You've been seduced by a demon. Oh yeah. You get a pastor getting up. We need to apologize to the LGBT. Show me where God apologized when He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Show me when King when King Asa God said, you know what? Destroy all the all the Sodomites. Clean up the land. A, a, a godly king. And guess who his father was? His son was? Jehoshaphat. And he did the same thing in the book of Kings. Check it out for yourself. See, real true prophets, real true, I'm talking about true prophets, not P R O F I T prophets. Send me a thousand dollars. Uh -uh. Oh, no, no. That's not a proof. That's a P-R-O-F-I-T prophet. A true prophet will also speak divine judgment. And the apostle. Now watch this. Here's a sorcerer. Witchcraft. A false prophet. And which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul, <clears throat> and he desired to hear the word of God. <clears throat> but Elimus, what's this? The sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation. That's what he meant. His word meant sorcery, witchcraft. You read the book of Revelations? It said, 21.8, those kind of operated people are going into hell. 
I mean, check it out. I'll just go ahead and read it. I don't like to just quote it. I'll read it to you for yourself. I'll prove it to you. And but the fearful and the abominable, unbelieving and murderers, whoremongers, and sorcerers shall have their part in the lake with burning with fire and brimstone. Sorcery. Witchcraft. You better burn up that Ouija board. You better quit going to fortune tellers. There's a man named Saul. Uh, he got in. He got into the witch indoor, and he got killed. She conjured up a, a familiar spirit that looked like Samuel, and it spoke to him, and it led to his death and his son's death. Well, actually, it led to his son's death, and Saul committed suicide. Fell on his own sword. That's what witchcraft will do. It will deceive you. And a lot of that in the church. You know, I'm going to go ahead and say this. I, I remember I was preaching that same fellowship I told you, Full Gospel Church in Christ, and one of the pastors of the church uh, had a church in El Monte, California. Pastor Joe Ortiz. Uh, sad to say that when I was there this, the first time I preached, his son Philip uh, was a gang member. Uh, he, he, he got killed uh, horribly. Uh, he was only like 18 years old. I, I attended his funeral. But second time they had like a minister's conference there and I was one of the keynote speakers. And they had this Latina group in there. And as they had this Latina group in there... Uh, the music was so loud. I mean, I was on the platform. I mean, I mean, deep, huge speakers. I mean, it was a blast in my ears. And this woman that was leading the group was singing. I saw in what the Bible talks about the discerning of spirits. Now, what is the discerning of spirits? It is seeing either angels or demons. And at this time, I saw this woman that was singing. Now, she was singing gospel songs. But I saw the lesbian witch spirit operating through her. And then I noticed <clears throat> that she was bringing women up there, pulling them out of the audience, and laying hands on them in a very sexual, suggestive manner. And every time she did that, I saw this black cloud coming over them. And I knew it was oppression. And here I am, shouting at the top of my voice, I'm binding the devil, everything. So Pastor Ortiz, after he finishes this, after they get done and introduces me, I went up there in that, in that, behind that pulpit. I said, now everything you've seen here is not of God. Matter of fact, this woman right here is a lesbian witch. And I rebuked her in front of that whole church. And I said, you need to repent and you need to get delivered. She didn't do that. She got angry. She started cussing at me. And of course, she ran out of the church. That's like the devil. People want to get delivered. They'll come up and they'll repent. Godly sorrow, work of repentance. Paul said, rebuke in front of all that all may fear. So I literally had to take all the people to, uh, that I got prayed for, that were oppressed, and had to get them free. And I saw preachers dancing to this. I saw preachers raising their hands. And it shocked me that their antenna spiritually was that dull. And didn't know that the devil brought a seducing spirit in there. Now I'll tell you what God did. See, where every time there is a, a, a false, there is the truth. Well, every time there is a, a, a seducing spirit, a familiar spirit, the Holy Ghost is about to show up. And that next night, I was preaching again, and the Lord said, Now you bring people up here, but I don't want you to lay your hands on them and for, for healing. He said, Just take your hands and move in front of their bodies, and I, my, my healing power will flow out of your hands into their bodies. And I watched God supernaturally did that. 
There are the supernatural manifestations of the Lord. But when they do, they don't glorify a man. They glorify Jesus. Amen. So watch this. Acts the 13th chapter. Verse 8. So Elimus the sorcerer for his name by interpretation withstood them seeking to turn away from the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the what? The Holy Ghost. Here's the function of the Holy Ghost. Here is your third witness about divine judgment. And Paul said, You, full of subtly and all mischief, you child of the devil. Now, enemy of all righteousness. Woo, this is strong and this is front of people, ladies and gentlemen. Will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, watch this. Behold the hand of the Lord. Not the hand of the devil. The hand of the Lord. The work of the Holy Ghost. Remember I told you, Jesus said, All manner of sin shall be forgiven except the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Here's another blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And now behold, of the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind. Oh, wait a minute, I thought Jesus had an anointing to open the, the, the blind. Yeah, that's one of the functions of the anointing. To open the blind. But this function here made this man blind. Interesting. He didn't say the devil made him blind. He said the hand of the Lord. You won't hear that preached in a Joel Osteen church. You won't hear that preached at a Kenneth Copeland convention. You won't hear that preached at, 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 at uh, TDJ's church. But it's right there in the Bible. I didn't make it up. Go check it out for yourself. Now watch this. Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seen, the sun for a season. What? Not seen, the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and darkness, and he was about seeking someone now. He's blind, leading him by the hand. Now watch this. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed. What did he believe? And astonished at Paul's doctrine of the Lord. So what does that tell you? God does have divine judgment. Oh yeah. Father, I pray right now, if you're watching me today and you're, you're a pastor or a, a, a preacher, I pray the fear of the Lord fall on you today. The Bible said the fear of the Lord is the, is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. Amen. If you've been entertaining seducing spirits, if you've been watching pornography, and pornography is, is, is one of the key spirits that will foul up the Holy Ghost in you, will mess up the gifts of the Spirit in you, will give you sexual images, and you think, well, wait a minute, I'm prophesying about people being healed. I'm prophesying about, about people being delivered and, and debt cancellations. But at the same time, you're not a prophet of God. You, you've, you've entertained a seducing spirit. And now you've gotten away from the way of God. Because God is always holy. The gifts of the Spirit are holy. God ain't, God ain't impressed with our charisma, ladies and gentlemen. He's looking for our godly character. So Father, I pray right now, if you're like that, you need to repent. If you're in a church like that, you need to go to that pastor. You need to tell him, I know what you're doing is not of God. I know that's a, the familiar spirit. I know that's a seducing spirit. Now, if he don't repent, then you get out of there. You get out of there. And whatever you do, don't let him lay your hands on you because that, he'll transfer that spirit. That's right. Hands can transfer spirits. Paul said, lay hands suddenly on no man. I, I'm going I'm to be honest with you. I'll just be straight with you. If I'm in a church, and I see that spirit functioning in somebody, and they come up and say, 
Well, up here, Apostle Roger, we want Blaine, We have a word for you. Oh, no, 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 no. I ain't going up here. And you can call me critical, but I'm going to protect the Holy Ghost in me. I'm protecting the anointing. I'm protecting this anointing. This anointing is precious. It's holy. And Paul said, Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Uh-uh. No, when I see that spirit functioning, I'm out of there. I don't care if you're driving a Mercedes, a Rolls Royce, and you're, or you're flying a $50 million jet. When I see that spirit operating, I don't want nothing to do with it. It's your $50 million jet, your Rolls Royce, your $10 million home ain't going to be the evidence of your anointing. Your anointing is it will remove burdens and destroy yokes. If you're not operating in the Spirit of God, if you're not operating under anointing, if people aren't being saved, healed, delivered, set free, then you are carrying probably a seducing spirit and you need to repent. Oh, glory to God. Amen. Father, I pray for every preacher right now. I pray, Lord, and I want you to go back and look at these scriptures. I ain't going to debate with you. I ain't going to argue with you. I don't have time for that. I'm going out today a little bit. There's somebody I'm going to pray for right now that needs healing. i got to get off of here. I'm going out today at that, at that high school. And I know God is telling these high school kids, get out of this homosexuality. Get out of this kind of lifestyle. Because I, I read in the Manila Times that there is... Uh, a 78% of increase of, home, of AIDS in this country from teenagers 15 to 17 years old. So I don't got time to play church. I don't got time to, to get in your Bible debates because Jesus is getting ready to return. And I want to tell you something. I love you enough. You Listen to me. I love you enough to tell you the truth. You won't get other preachers like me. You won't get apostles like me. You won't get bishops like me. Because they want this right here. Show me the money. Show me the money. Oh, I'll prophesy to you. Just give me the money. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. No. I will never. I will never sell out the precious anointing that God gave me to preach in the church and preach out on the streets for any amount of money. It won't happen. I've already been bought with a price. That's why I can preach anything I want to because nobody owns me except the Lord. God bless you today and I love you.